Well, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to this the latest European Parliamentary Research Service book talk. And this afternoon, we're going to be talking about this book, Policy Making in the European Union. It's been a, a standard work, indeed, in many ways, a landmark text in the literature of European integration studies for not only many years, but many decades. The first edition came out in the 1970s. It's now in its eighth edition. And for many students of European politics over the years, it's been an absolutely essential point of repair, reference point for the study and understanding of the way that the European communities and subsequently the European Union function, with a focus not just on the EU institutions, but how they interact uh, in the policy process and how they come together and have come together in an increasingly diverse range of policy fields to determine the policy priorities of the member states and, of course, the Union collectively. And we're particularly delighted uh, this afternoon to be joined by two of the uh, co-editors and co-authors of uh, this of this book, Policy Making in the European Union, namely um, Dame Professor Helen Wallace, um, who has been a major figure in the study of European integration throughout the period in question, and is now today an honorary professor at the University of Sussex, and Alastair Young, who's professor at the Sam Nunn School of International Affairs at Georgia Institute of Technology in the United States, from which I believe he joins us right now. So thank you so much for getting up relatively early uh, stateside to join us today. Uh, we had hoped to be uh, joined by Cristilla Radera Reining, uh, who's another of the uh, co-authors and co-editors of this book, but unfortunately she's had to pull out at the last minute because of a, a personal uh, engagement, and uh, it's a pity, but that's life. But I think we've got uh, two people centrally involved, one from the very start, one more recently, who can talk with authority about this book, and to comment after they have told us a little bit on, a little bit about how the book was born, why they thought that it was important to communicate about policy making in the European Union, what they're trying to communicate in uh, the successive editions of this book. We'll have two discussants, namely Jim Close, uh, Secretary General of TEPSA, which is a, a kind of trans-European um, consortium of, of think tanks interested in Europe and uh, previously, and very well known to us, of course, in the EU policy field, uh, Deputy Director General in the General Secretary of the Council, and famous, most famously, the author of European Council Conclusions, and Professor Gabby Umbach from the European University Institute, who's also a, um, a non-resident visiting fellow at EPRS and worked in EPRS uh, some years ago. So welcome to, to all of you. I'm going to ask um, Helen Wallace and Alistair Young to uh, speak first. Uh, Helen Wallace uh, was from 2001 to 2006, director of the Robert Schumann Center, uh, at the European University Institute in Florence. And of course, we here in the European Parliament have a very close relationship uh, with the EUI. And it's uh, great that uh, she was one of the um, standard bearers of that process at, a, at an early stage. Uh, she was also a professor in uh, European studies at the uh, European Institute in the London School of Economics from 2007 to 2013, and previously worked uh, on the One Europe or Several program at the uh, Economic and Social Research Council in the United Kingdom, at Chatham House, the Royal Institute for International Relations, a, a prominent London-based uh, foreign policy think tank, and at the College of Europe uh, in Bruges. And she's also a fellow of the British Academy, which is a very distinguished uh, academic uh, accolade indeed, a body of which she was the Foreign Secretary and Vice President from 2011 to 2015. And she's the author of uh, 25 books, monographs, or pamphlets on various aspects of EU politics, including, of course, uh, being the co-author and co-editor of all eight editions of this book, Policy Making in the European Union. So without further ado, uh, over to Dame Helen to tell us a little bit about how and why the book was born and what it seeks to communicate about what's important in EU policy making. Anthony, a big thank you to you and Joanne Rapap for inviting me and Alistair to share in this event. Uh, it's a uh, pleasant opportunity in difficult times to think about something positive rather than negative. Um, you didn't say it, Anthony, but it's the case. I'm the only dinosaur who survives from the first edition of this book. Um, there have been a lot of changes across the years. Why did we do the book in the first place? I mean, this is uh, belongs to the period of British accession to the European communities as they then were. 
when there was a literature, but the literature was mostly in French, which was fine, but obviously less accessible to um, British audiences. Uh, there were two big books, the books by Annie Haas and Lane Lemberg in the American literature, but they were very academistic books, both very fine books by fine authors. And what we were trying to do in putting this book together was to produce a text that could be used both for teaching and for research with target audiences, both in the academic community and the practitioner community. And Jim will no doubt comment on that. Trying to provide something that would be helpful for people interested in a particular sector, which might be agriculture or whatever. Uh, but also those with wider interests. And both those inside the then European community and those outside trying to understand it. And it's interesting, in the last couple of weeks, I've had contacts with ambassadors from Japan and Canada to the European Union who have relied on a literature to help them understand what was going on. We were also trying to do something that was distinctive as a textbook by engaging top experts in each of the fields covered so that there would be a high standard of evidence and argument and it set a template for what became the new European series and I'm reminded Jim the last time you and I met was at the SEPS meeting to celebrate the work of John Peterson who picked up the policy making book and developed it into a wider series and as we built a transnational and interdisciplinary team we helped to build networks that were drawn on in other projects and I maintained links with um, contributors from, from that and, and subsequent editions. There were always tough choices to be made about the contents and we always had to battle a little bit with OUB as to which fields to cover. Some came and went. Energy was in the first edition as it happens. So we hit the jackpot was the single market in the first edition and that was in the mid-1970s. Um, but we tried to include core areas obviously like agriculture but also ones that came and went. And crucially we were trying to get beyond the formal institutional recipes to informal practice and experience on the ground. Um, I think what is, and Alistair will say more about this, the, the diversity that emerges from that is important. Um, and it's also interesting, I, I think all libraries should keep all, all eight editions on their shelves and not just the most recent one, because if you read across the different um, editions from the mid 1970s to now you can plot the evolution of changes so they become a kind of history book as as well how well have we done in responding to events and context and that's a, an important question as we face the crisis in ukraine for the ninth edition um i think we've not done too badly i think we picked up the 1992 project we picked up the enlargement project we picked up the emerging justice and home affairs areas of discussion in successive um, in successive generations. Um, I, let me also say there's been an intergenerational process. Two of the people that I can see on the grid are former PhD students of mine. Um, several of the others in the um, in the contribution in the list of contributors have been. Um, connected in one way or another from students onwards. And let me say, I really think it's important that the baton is passed across the generations in the literature and the commentariat, because you don't want to get stuck with the views of an old fogey like me when you're facing the crises of the 2020s. Thank you, Anthony. Thank you. It's a great pleasure. And I can actually tell you that we have, as far as I know, all of the eight editions of the book in our historical library in Luxembourg, uh, because we keep their papers and uh, books and monographs and documents of various kinds. In addition to the archives, we keep their things that uh, really help uh, understand the evolution of the EU as a political system. So um, that's one place, I think, in the world where you might find all eight editions. 
doubtless one can also find them on a libris or ebay or whatever but there one could go and consult them uh, free of charge uh, thank you very much uh, in indeed um helen for that uh, very nice uh, introduction and to take us forward in terms of uh, the now and the future of the book potentially are going to go over to Professor Alastair Young. As I mentioned earlier, he's Professor at the Sam Nunn School of International Affairs at Georgia Institute of Technology. And thank you once again for joining us uh, from the other side of the Atlantic relatively early in the day. And at the um, Georgia Institute, he co-directs its Center for International Strategy, Technology and Policy and also the Center for European and Transatlantic Studies. He's also a co-editor of the Journal of Common Market Studies, and many of you online at the moment will recognize the JCMS as an absolutely critical component in the study of the European Union over multiple decades, and has been chair of the EU Studies Association of the United States, EUSA. And uh, I can uh, m just mention perhaps that the um, European Parliament will be co-hosting through our Washington office one of the panels at the forthcoming May conference of EUSA in Miami. Over to you. Thank you. Good morning from Atlanta. The sun is, is rising in front of me, so you can see the shadows behind me. Um, and this is one of the other places you can find all eight editions of the policymaking book. There we on the bookshelf behind me. Um, so, as Helen mentioned, this is the policy making is an edited textbook. And so it doesn't have a conventional argument that engages with the debate that you get in with a monograph. But that said, there are two important messages that the book has had from the outset. So, one is that the attempt to mainstream the study of the European Union policymaking process and arguing that it can be understood using tools from international relations and comparative politics. And the, you know, while the EU is a unique policy arena, the politics that shape it are, are familiar um, to other settings. Now, that is now a relatively mainstream view in EU studies, but at the time, the volume was one of the first to make that case. And my chapter with Cristilla in this book is sort of the most explicit manifestation of the continuation of that line of argument. The volume also makes the point that there is not a one size fits all way of understanding EU policymaking. That said, there are recognizable patterns which manifest themselves in different contexts. I'm just going to share a one slide here. I'm not going to talk through it. I'm just going to have it there. So, you so these are the five policy modes or ideal types of policy making that Helen developed. And the policy modes capture different allocations of authority between the EU and the member states, different roles for the EU's institutions, different patterns of participation by societal actors, and involve different resource requirements. So the key findings in the eighth edition, and for this I draw heavily on the conclusion uh, for which Cristilla was a major contributor, but also our friend and colleague Mark Pollock actually took the lead. And the idea was to looking at what our contributors had said about the individual case study chapters, we sought to identify both trends in EU policymaking um, and to assess how the EU has responded to the key challenges in the previous five years. So one of the challenges with doing a textbook where you have the publisher regularly pushing you to uh, produce the book. Oxford wanted it produced every three years. Um, we wanted a longer run, but it's also the, the publisher wants it to be new and different. And so there's sort of a bit of a pressure and to, to focus on um, the reason or what, at least what's happened since the last edition. And so that's part of what we were doing in the conclusion. What we identified was five trends in EU policymaking. One is that there is increasing divergence rather than convergence in the modes of policymaking. We observe the rise of new, even hybrid policy modes that combine, adapt, adjust the traditional modes and instruments in highly flexible and innovative ways. For instance, in privacy protection, member states are represented through a network of national independent regulators but these networks are incorporated in supranational policymaking. A second trend 
was a shift in the prominence amongst policy modes. One of the key features, and which has been going on for a long time, that was accelerated by Lisbon, was the rise of the European Parliament um, in wider and wider interest of policy making, and that led for a shift from the community method toward a more regulatory mode where you had um, the, particularly with the involvement of the parliament. The other shift we noticed was the rise of policy coordination becoming a more important mode. We also observed an increase in the number of, of there being multiple modes of policy making occurring within the same policy area. Economic and monetary union is a particularly extreme example of this. So you have the strong European central bank centered community method, monetary policy. You have an increasingly strict and elaborate procedures of policy coordination for national fiscal policies. There were a variation of the regulatory mode for banking regulation, a variant of the distributive mode and the operation of the European stability mechanism and a very strong element of intensive transgovernmentalism with the rise of the Eurogroup and Euro summits as the key decision-making forum for managing the Euro area crisis. The fourth trend, and this I was reminded in our conversation pairing this, was talking about the renegotiation of the role between the member states and the European Union in the policy process, and this echoes back to the, the uh, policy pendulum that uh, Helen introduced in the third or fourth edition, I can't remember which one it was. Um, I did look, but I can't now remember the answer. And there is evidence of increasing contention and contestation around the ways the boundaries are drawn between Europe and national layers of governance. But there are contrasting trends in different policy areas. So the shift towards centralization was most pronounced in those policy areas most directly affected by the financial crisis, such as fiscal consolidation, labor market reform, as requirements attached to the bailouts. But by contrast, the member states asserted their authority in responding to the surge of migrants in 2015. And we may now be seeing a new shift on that front. Even in the common agricultural policies, reforms have increased the discretion of member states enjoy in allocating their national envelopes. So these four developments mean that the ideal types are perhaps less useful than they were. More activities do not fit neatly within one, and more policy areas are left well, less well explained by particular, a particular policy mode. And we had a discussion about this, but we think that they are still useful. Because quite a bit of EU policymaking does fit pretty well within one or other mode. And secondly, the modes also describe the building blocks of more hybrid modes. So the fifth trend we noticed was the erosion of the boundary between the international and external policies. Sometimes international cooperation is necessary to achieve internal uh, policy objectives. This is most evident with respect to climate change. You also have internal policies that have significant external impacts, data protection, competition policy, lots of consumer safety regulations. And you also have external obligations shaping EU policies, either in terms of commitments or in terms of constraints, such as WTO law. The second thing we did in the volume, in the conclusion, was to think about how well the EU has responded to the four main challenges that we had identified since the previous edition. It's the increased politicization of the European Union, the European politics process, it's Brexit, what we called heightened geopolitical uncertainty, which at the time involved increasingly aggressive Russia, we had not seen anything yet. The rise of China, which has also intensified since we went to press, and a less reliable United States under Donald Trump, a concern which has eased somewhat since he left the White House, and the fourth challenge being the COVID-19 pandemic. We found that the impact of politicization and populism varied dramatically across issue areas. Uh, the rise of populist parties, <coughs> excuse me, that combine Euroscepticism with anti-immigrant attitudes made cooperation on ex accepting migrants very hard. Environmental and energy policies have also been responsive to public concern about climate change, but here politicization has pushed towards centralized and progressive policies. 
enlargement, which is both highly salient and subject to possible referenda, is highly susceptible to populist appeals and public opinion. The negotiations of the Transatlantic Trade and Investment Partnership and the Com Comprehensive Economic and Trade Agreement with Canada were highly politicized, but other EU trade negotiations haven't been. Other policies, areas such as the single market, competition policy, uh, overseas development assistance, by contrast, seem to be largely insulated from politicization, with the notable exception of the free movement of labor in the UK Leave campaign. But politicization, we found, very rarely actually led to the freeze in the European policy process, as post functionalist scholars had feared. <clears throat> with respect to the um, with respect to Brexit, we were severely limited in the fact that we were writing it we went to press in August 2020. So <clears throat> it was very <clears throat> it was hard to see what was going to, to happen, but we asked our contributors to think about what might the likely implications be. And the general conclusion was that we likely have a relatively marginal impact. In regulation and trade, the UK's departure would weaken the Liberal coalition, but not necessarily enough to make a substantive difference to policy outcomes. In common foreign and security policy, Brexit further undermined the EU's already low capacity, but the UK wasn't a major contributor to CFSP emissions prior to the referendum. The conclusion was that Brexit is likely to have the greatest impacts with respect to climate change and enlargement, where the UK has been an important champion. We saw the, if the difficult geopolitical context creating challenges and opportunities within and across policy areas, but they only affected a few core EU policies. With respect to trade and climate change, US policy both impeded the EU's objectives and bequeathed, a greater, bequeathed it a greater global importance. The Russian threat and US unreliability gave new impetus to further development of the CFSP, though progress there was limited, something to which we may return about what the current context implies for that. In terms of development policy, China's willingness to lend without domestic political conditions makes it harder for the EU to demand good governance and respect for human rights. COVID-19 was particularly challenging as it was only emerging as a challenge to the EU as we were frantically writing. We kind of came to the conclusion, I mean, so when the pandemic hit, the member states primarily looked to themselves rather than to the EU, but the EU relatively quickly became constructively engaged. We didn't find so early on any evidence that COVID was changing EU policy process that much. The European Commission and the Central Bank used their delegated powers aggressively to facilitate and support the member states' fiscal responses to the economic shock of lockdowns. The European Council's deliberations over COVID relief, tied up in the um, budget process, were fraught and featured similar divisions between net contributors and recipients, albeit with Germany in an unusually constructive role. That discussion did, however, result in a novel approach to financing the relief through the effort of, through issuing collective debt. So in terms of what we sort of took away from the volume is that the EU's day-to-day -day policymaking reveals great flexibility, formal and informal. As a result, the diversity of forms of EU policymaking have increased within as well as between issue areas. The EU's policy process in all their diversity have once again proven remarkably resilient to both internal and external challenges. The causes and implications of that resilience vary across the challenges. With respect to the geopolitical upheavals, the EU's resilience with respect to trade, to trade and climate change reflect established strength. With respect to foreign policy, is more a product of the limited the EU's limited role, even in a more benign environment. The EU's apparent resilience in the wake of Brexit reflects in part that the UK had long chosen not to participate in core policy areas of 
Schengen uh, and Economic and Monetary Union, and enough other member states share the UK's preferences to prevent an abrupt change in policy. The resilience of EU policymaking process in the face of increased politicization has also been impressive, although one could argue that it reflects on a lack of political responsiveness that is not entirely to the Union's credit. It is nevertheless a striking achievement for the EU's 27 to have withstood the departure of a large and important member state and carried on business as, as usual in a period of economic and political turmoil. Thank you. Well, thank you very much indeed, Alistair, for that both very wide ranging and also intellectually challenging intervention. We, uh, we much appreciate it. Um, for those of you who've just tuned in, we're talking about this book, Policymaking in the European Union, the eighth edition thereof, and two of the co authors and co editors are online talking about the genesis, the content, the direction of the book as it's sought over several decades to chart the evolution of policymaking in the Union. I also note among the attendees, we've got Bridget Laffin online, who's uh, one of the co-authors of the chapter, the chapter on budgetary politics in the European Union. So welcome uh, to Bridget. Also notice uh, Rennie, uh, Rennie Haverkamp here, who's of course a veteran of EU policymaking and the political system, uh, and somebody who was friendly with and indeed worked with some of the founding fathers of the European Union. So it's a particular pleasure to have Rene among the audience today. Now we've got two discussants who are going to give their perspective prompted by this book on policymaking in the European Union. Both are well known to us here in the Parliament and the first of these is Jim Close who as I mentioned uh, at the beginning is the Secretary General now of the Trans-European Policy Studies Association, TEPSA, a network of European related think tanks and academic bodies based in Brussels. Until January 2021, he was Deputy Director General in the Council Secretariat, where he was responsible for inter alia, the preparation of European Council meetings and conclusions. Previously held a variety of director roles in the Council Secretariat, and before that was Chef de Cabinet to a President of the European Commission. And he's also an author on uh, EU uh, policies and politics, so Le Traité de Maastricht, Genèse, Analyse, Commentaire, and uh, more recently, National Leaders in the Making of Europe, which is a series of, of fascinating portraits of European Council meetings and European crises. And uh, after Jim, we're going to be joined by Gabby, who I'll introduce at that moment. Over to you first, Jim. Thank you very much, Anthony. I'm very pleased to be part of this. And uh, Helen, I remember your last meeting and uh, I have fond memories of John Peterson, of course, uh, who was one of the many British uh, researchers uh, telling us interesting stories about the European Union. At a time when bombs are raining down on a neighboring European country, it may seem a bit incongruous to have an academic debate about the processes, the functioning of the European Union, but it's not at all. As history is unfolding, it makes eminent sense to try and better understand where the Union comes from and where it is headed. To reflect on the historical development and evolution of our integration project and to provide ideas for further developments against the background of a world that is changing fast and radically. And this is exactly what this uh, stunning eighth edition does and actually all eight editions have been doing this and uh, you are right to point out that this is a, a history a writing of the history as it evolves and it's extremely useful in that respect the first thing the book tells us is that the eu has over the last decades undergone fundamental transformations while preserving the underlying system and dna it has done so First, via treaty changes, as you all remember, between 1985 and 2009, there have been many treaty changes. The Union has gradually built up its regulatory system, democratic functioning, full co-decision for the Parliament, was mentioned before, uh, new community competences. But at the same time, it has created a single policy. It has entered into foreign policy, uh, justice and home affairs, and all of that. The second instrument, if I may call it that, or uh, to uh, transform is crisis, is crisis management. Uh, in the phase from 2008 till now, we have been in a constant crisis management mode. 
uh, and this has fundamentally transformed the union. I don't know whether people realize to what extent actually the union of today compared to the union in 2008 is much more integrated because we were found one thing in many areas, but actually the response across the board has been to be more integrated. And I find that fascinating. Your book bears testimony to all of that. And it provides fascinating insights into how the e union has done all of this. And there's one point which Alistair made, which is really, in my view, key. It shows the flexibility of our system to adapt. And it shows that the EU is a multifaceted animal. That brings me uh, to a, a fundamental remark. When I read part one of this book, um, all the theoretical debates about what the union is or not is not uh, made me think of the fact that depending on where you put the cursor, uh, which area you're looking at, the EU looks completely different. Uh, and you have this talk about opposition between community methods, intergovernmentalism, all other kinds of integration. The debate is fascinating, but if I may be very honest with you, it's often a bit artificial and sterile. Uh, many researchers seem to dive into a theoretical debate without taking the trouble to get the basic premises right. If I may caricature a bit, you have a federalist school which reasons as if the EU was or should be a federal state, the intergovernmental school, which cannot conceive of the EU as anything but a glorious intergovernmental organization. They are, if I may say so, very often trapped in a Westphalian approach of life. The fact of the matter is that the union is neither the one nor the other, or you could also put it differently, it is both at the same time. As the book says in its introduction, it is well nigh impossible to um, stick one label to the European Union as such and look only at it through that prism. It would be useful more generally, even in this book, I would say, I think it would be more useful to try and attempt a more positive, a positive description of what the union is and it's not. In my view, it's a union of states and peoples. We have created a new legal order, which we should put forward much more, rather than having a sterile debate on whether it's intergovernmental or community-like. I can, in this respect, maybe refer you to a report uh, which the Committee of the Regions has sent to the uh, Conference on the Future of Europe about democracy in Europe and of Europe, uh, because it actually tries to see what is democracy in and of Europe. So, in my view, it is important that uh, when you look at the European Union, that you go back to the basics. You look at what it is and how it has developed. Uh, I sometimes am a bit surprised when I say, for instance, big theories about new intergovernmentalism. I don't know what it means. There's nothing new. There are areas where we have intergovernmental approaches. We've always had them. And there are areas where we apply the community method. One of the principles which I really think should be explained, of course, it is done in a way, but it's the principle of conferral of competences. Sovereign states, friends, Mid competences to the EU, but they do it in different ways. Sometimes in total, like for the CAP or the single currency or trade, sometimes not at all. Sometimes there are mixed competences, they are shared with the member states still. Then you have competences which are complementary to national policies. And then, of course, you have things like the intergovernmental pillars where you decide. Uh, not to transfer competence, but to exercise it together. Now, the way decision-making extent is, of course, very much predicated on what the treaty says. I mean, you sometimes get the impression that policymakers have a choice. Now, this morning, we wake up, we go into governmental, and next morning, we go community. That's rubbish. It's the treaty which tells you what you can do. And uh, uh, now, Jean Foste portes ouvertes with the people like you, of course, but I think sometimes the very simplest things help you better understand. And my point I want to make is, once you have established this very basic understanding, 
about what the union is and is not, then your work, the analysis of the different modes, policy modes, which uh, Alistair so clearly explained, becomes much more interesting because it's linked to the real world. And of course, it is true that we have established all those various modes. And sometimes via a treaty change, we switch from one mode to the other. Look at Schengen, for instance. There are many examples like that. So uh, 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 in that sense, I read the case studies. I find it's a fascinating uh, account of the history. I read them in a, maybe in a slightly different way, but I read them with having as a background, the basic idea of what the union is and how it developed. This brings me to another important point. It's the role of the European Council. Now, uh, Anthony has heard me time and time talk about this. Uh, I think in the past, particularly in the academic work, it has often been uh, completely underestimated. Maybe to some extent, I don't want to be nasty, but uh, to some extent it's because most of the research uh, which is funded in Europe is funded by the Commission and the Parliament, never by the European Council and only rarely by the Council. So maybe that has a certain effect on how people uh, look at this. It is true that people have understood now in the crisis situation that the European Council really is an important actor uh, because in a crisis situation, it plays a key role. But what I want to say is that it has always played, since its inception in 1973, a major role in the European Union. People sometimes talk with nostalgia about Jack Delors. So do I, in a way. I was around at the time. He was a great president. But the idea that the law shaped the policy in the sense of saying what to do is wrong. What the law did brilliantly was to tell the European Council how to do it. That's what a good commission president does. Now, the European Council has played a major role in two ways. One, as a kind of Übervater to the Council, because after all, the people sitting in the Council, uh, they are the bosses of those people. And secondly, and this is also something which is underestimated, the European Union is also a club of national leaders. That means in the present Ukraine crisis or in the subprime crisis, they could collectively agree on a certain number of things. There was zero competence for the EU. So you need all of this. Uh, uh, thing. Now, very often, uh, uh, one of the points which I, I often make is that to understand the union, you have to play the interplay between the European Council and the other institutions. It very often happens that the community method only works because you have a political direction given by the European Council. The political direction of the European Council is now uh, written down in the uh, treaty at Article 15, but of course they have always been uh, doing this. If you take, for instance, the COVID crisis, just in a, in a nutshell, the, the question of the RRF, the recovery fund, which is revolutionary, how did it come about? I'll tell you how it came about. First, there were some member states exchanging views on this. Then the European Council took it up and they said to the Eurogroup, can you have a look at economic governance, please, and work on this. They did it. They actually agreed on three quite important programs, the Shore program for unemployed people and the EIB and the ESM being used for them. But they couldn't agree on this recovery fund. So what did the European Council do? It said, OK, we endorsed what they've done. And now we task the Commission to do a comprehensive approach, a proposal, according to the community method, on the MFF plus a recovery fund. That was the way it worked. And then the Commission did a very good job doing it. But my point is that one without the other wouldn't have worked. Without the European Council, the Commission would not have managed even to do its proposal in this way, and certainly it wouldn't have been accepted. But without the community system, what the European Council said, and the community system is, of course, uh, includes very much the European Parliament now, because co-decision is basically across the board, and so without the community system, those taskings and requests by the European Council would lead to nothing. So that is, uh, so I don't see an opposition between the two. I see them working together when all goes well. Uh, my next point is uh, uh, one I often make about the institutional system. Our in institutional system is based on what I said before, that we are a union of sovereign states and of peoples. 
we have democratic member countries who participate in the work of the Council and the European Council. They are under the control of national parliaments. We have a directly elected parliament, and we do not have an, a kind of uh, unlegitimate commission of bureaucrats. That's rubbish. Uh, the commission derives its legitimacy from, one, the member countries, because they propose candidates according to political majorities nationally. Number two, the council endorsing them in total. Number three, the European Parliament elected in the, has to vote for them. I mean, if that is not democratically legitimate, then you have to explain you, to me uh, how uh, the American uh, government is legitimate, because they are not directly elected at all either. So uh, um, now, uh, one of the things I always invade again is the false good ideas like Spitzenkandidat and all of that. Why? Because it would fundamentally change the system. Now, you can put that on the table, but then you have to do it in the open, not via backroom deals, as it was done in 2014 and 19. And you have an honest debate about whether the Europeans want a move towards a federal stage. Uh, this is uh, something which um, uh, many people defend, and you can defend it, but I personally do not believe in it, but you have to play it out in the open. What I believe very much in is that the Union has actually managed quite well. And again, when I go through your book, it's fascinating to read about everything we've done. And we've done so very often uh, via political agreement by consensus among the member countries in the European Council and then using the community method. Uh, you look at the various policy modes. Now, it is true, as I said before, that both via treaty change and via crisis management, we have actually integrated more. I gave the example of Schengen. I gave uh, 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 sometimes even things which were not based on anything in the treaty. We have done joint procurement for vaccines, which for me is absolutely fundamental. Uh, so I think that by describing the development of the policies uh, in, in such detail and such a professional way, uh, this also gives us ideas to move forward. Because, for instance, uh, it seems to me that if you look at the experience of COVID, then maybe there is an argument to be made in the health area to become a bit more federal, to put it at a different on a different footing and make it a bit more federal. So I do not believe in a federal Europe. I believe in a Europe which has a mix of intergovernmental and federal and other elements, but where you always have the possibility, if you need it, to become more federal, more centralized. And as I told you, this is exactly what has happened uh, over the last uh, few years. I conclude maybe coming back to the Ukraine crisis very briefly. What it shows is something people have increasingly become aware of over the past years, particularly since 2016, with Brexit, Trump, and all the other developments. History has not ended. It shows that the EU, while preserving its DNA and all the things you describe in the various policies, it must add now a more systematic, a more professional uh, instrument of crisis management, strategic autonomy and the capacity to be a global player with power. Now, the last few days have been extraordinary in accelerating those trends. The EU's response has been a mixture of initiatives, community-based, intergovernmental, purely national, all under the umbrella and guidance of the European Council. Uh, I think, once again, the uh, when People will look back at the Union maybe in 30 or 40 years. I personally think that the developments, particularly after 2016 and now with Russia, will have been a major element in a stronger Europe. Thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed, Jim, with those reflections based on uh, a wealth of experience of policy making at the very highest level in the EU institutions. Last but not least, our second discussion and our fourth speaker the afternoon is Gabby Umbach, part-time professor at the EUI in Florence, director of its uh, joint project Global Stat, which EPRS is uh, a partner with, or two, a fantastic website which essentially takes official data from around the world and presents them in an accessible and user-friendly format, and the uh, lead consortium member on global governance in the H2020 Trigger Consortium. She's also 
adjunct professor at the Universities of Cologne and Innsbruck, and book review editor of the Journal of Common Market Studies, as well as being a non-resident visiting fellow at EPRS, where she previously worked on research methodology and academic outreach. Over to you, Gabby. Thank you very much, Anthony, and thank you very much for having me today um, on what is really an iconic book, actually, for all of us. Um, I, I want to um, share my thoughts in, in four points and against the backdrop of three notions. So the, the four points will be um, on, the, on an iconic classic, indeed, um, what is new in it, a wish list for the ninth edition, and the fourth one is extrapolation to what um, actually um, Jim already did to the current crisis. And the three notions that I think the book inspires us to think in and, and over are um, development, change and future, indeed. Um, Alistair, you said that the time spans us in five years and that you are reflecting on the challenges and change and the reaction of the EU. Um, over these five years um, of the different editions. And I think um, a lot of what, what Jim just referred to is actually what makes the book such an iconic classic. So you offer an analysis of certain moments in time, but given that we have this circular revision of the book, actually we have many moments in time where we can look into development and change apart from the ad hoc dis description of the status of European integration in any given moment. So indeed, I think that, um, Helen, what, what you said about the live living commentariat of the EU is something that makes the book so um, important for EU studies and for EU study scholars. So um, if we look into what it makes an iconic classic, Obviously, for many of us, it has become and still is the go to sources in our teaching, right? So, if you want to give students a source at hand that combines politics, policy making, and the overall idea of description of central polity, policies, it's, it's the book um, to consult. Um, Anthony mentioned it since 77, so the first Wallace Wallace Web describes ever since the communities, how politics and policies have changed. Um, it also gives us an idea of the modernity and the changes within the policy areas, just as the present one. I'm going to, to look into that, what is new in it. So you take up policies that become important um, and you also retire for certain additions, policies that are more established or potentially have been integrated into other areas. So. Basically, it presents us with a decade spanning expertise on what we are analyzing and offers us the instruments at hand to analyze that. And why is it so beneficial? Because it's not just mono focused. It just doesn't only present the theories or the politics, or the policy making the policies, but it combines that in a more holistic view. So you get insight into the benefits of integration theories to analyze this sui generis body. Um, you get insight into the policy making, into the institutions and into the policy developments. And that's why I think nearly everyone who ever studied or studies European integration um, is well advised and is using this book. So um, on the new elements, and here I think the eighth edition is very um, right in selecting those, not only from the policy point of view, but also from the potential of explaining change. Um, and potentially also the future of EU integration in these areas. So the new elements, and Alistair, you referred to that, very much focus on the expansion of the EU policy agenda, right? So they integrate digital policy making. Um, and here we go beyond just a new policy area. We understand elements of transnational private regulation that are important. Um, and Newman here combines this dual policy agenda into market orientation and also privacy regulation. So on the one hand, we have a policy area where market regulation of telecommunications is important, but at the same time, due to the privacy concerns that are related and the data protection concerns that are related to the policy area, the EU has to diversify regulation within one policy area in a way that also human rights, privacy, and data protection are concerned. So general ideas of how we want to regulate our information society. And that's very interesting to see in the new policy chapter 
on digital um, policies, how the EU combines these two elements and develops out of that something that uh, indeed, Alistair, you take up in the conclusion, which is for me also a very important part, the diversification of modes within one policy area. Rightly so, the new edition also integrates international development policy. Very important element if we look into global governance concerns, not only because it's a response to the common but differentiated um, responsibility paradigm of global governance, but it also offers reflections on the EU as a global actor and on geopolitics of global governance and international relations, something that is more and more important, as um, and Alistair already mentioned, that sometimes the, the, over, the, over layer, the, the overlaps and layers are blurred. So this is a very important new addition. Um, obviously, and here I will relate to when I come to my wish list later on, obviously the part of politicization also beyond Brexit is a very important element in the new book, um, taking up change and developments in the future, um, which potentially go beyond contestation of particular policies, but also of the way we do politics and we do organize policy making within the EU. I come back to that on my wish list. And finally, the contextualization, which is very important to understand the EU and the developments around the EU over the past five years span, so from, from um, 2015 to 2020, meaning the geopolitical dimension of the EU's engagement in international relations and global governance. And here you, you listed the migration uh, move and wave in 2015, the global financial crisis, the um, US as America first foreign policy approach, and also Brexit. So um, if we look into the conclusions, actually they lay out already the agenda for the new edition, which is very good, and summarize it across the policy areas, the developments of the EU over the past five, five years. So indeed, we have the assessment of challenges, that shaped the EU over the past five year interval from which we can learn. But you also pointed something that is very future oriented. So this experimentation style, the hybridization of policy modes um, and a con continuing diversity and, and multiplicity of modes of governance in the policy areas that become hybrid, hybrid and, and experimental, which for me is very important if we look into the future of the EU, because this will shape the political system um, in the two decades to come from my point of view. And here I'm at my third point on my personal wish list for the ninth edition, and that relates exactly to the modes of governance, um, where we have seen a certain stabilization of the number of modes of governance, and you showed the, the, the list from the regulatory approach towards the more coordinative approach indeed. Um, and something that is more and more coming up, diversification in the methods of policy making, which is important to understand also aspects of politicization and, and contestation within EU policy making. So what do I mean by that? I mean by that it would be great if we could look more in depth into EU public policy in a way that looks at elements of public policy making within the EU that support transparency, um, accountability and legitimacy. And here I'm particularly refer um, referring to a deconstruction of the policy cycle. In your chapter, um, Alistair, you, you refer a lot to the policy cycle and give a really, really good explanation and analysis of why it is important, also linking that to houses epistemic community uh, ideas and to ideas of, um, or an insight rather, of the impact of delegated acts, acts, for example, on expertise and how expertise is injected. But I'm referring to something that we call the evidence turn, which I think would be a super addition to, to the understanding of policymaking as the book describes it. Um, and, and here in particular, evidence informed policymaking. So an understanding that we don't have a linear policy cycle where expertise, knowledge, evidence is injected at a certain point, it kicks off and then comes out to the control of implementation. But rather this um, non-linearity that is caused by the multiplication of access point towards the policy cycle 
um, actually obliges us in a way to review previous concepts of um, expert affiliation towards policymaking within the EU. Uh, and here, um, you rightly so um, speak of the house concept of academic community building, but also the policy coordination, open method of coordination that's changed that in, in the late 1990s. So um, with these methods, new methods of policy making, I also open up to something that I said in the beginning to the future. So some of these modes are very strongly focused on anticipatory policy making, which I think will be something that the EU is, is moving towards already, but will embrace at supranational and national level even more in the future and will have to. Meaning, what does it mean um, to make policies in a union that wants to act ahead of crisis? Um, foresight is one horizon scanning, scenario building, um, but also all the other methods of policy making that inject information and expertise in those processes of impact assessments, um, ex ante, ex post evaluations, added value analysis, so everything that also the parliament is very, very much engaged in. Plus, finally, co-creation and participatory governance. These are elements, I think, that also the academic community needs to um, actually understand in the way that the book over the past 40 years understood policy making uh, and to engage in describing it in a way that both is useful for students and for practitioners to embrace. Um, in order to overcome this divide in between policy making as understood as a rather closed policy cycle and the idea of co-creation and participatory government governance that is more and more circle circulating in in our debate be it over the conference on the future of europe participatory budgeting as we see it at local level so these even stronger hybridization of governance that we see in recent years um so now on, on extrapolating for our discussion today and um, also for showing how much we can apply the knowledge that the book presents and that the history of the book presents um, on today. So um, Jim already mentioned that um, and this relates to the literature that, that speaks of the um, of the EU having turned to event politics like Van Middelaar, for example, or the crisisification of EU policy making, as Reinhardt described it. So what can we actually learn about the insights of the book over time into the potential of the EU to render, to translate ad hoc solutions into system transformation. So how much will be, we be able, again, so from, from, from your perspective and assessment, how much will the EU be able to um, systemize and to institutionalize this abundance and this quantum leap, leap of, of transformative steps that we've seen over the past five days, let alone the idea of the European Green Deal that will shift the EU if implemented according to the letters from a socio-economic policy paradigm towards an eco-social policy paradigm. So how much is the EU really able to absorb and to translate these quantum leaps, quantum leap crisis reactions that we often saw into institutional reform to make the EU fit for the future and to translate that into mechanisms of EU policy making ahead of crisis. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much indeed, Garby. Thank you for those very interesting uh, remarks and also for the role that you play in acting as a kind of bridge between the worlds of academia and practice. Uh, we're still getting our heads around this notion of a non-linear policy cycle. Uh, but I think uh, in our own way here in EPRS, we've done quite a lot to uh, sensitize people in the parliament and more widely to the notion of policy cycle in the EU system, both uh, in terms of ex ante, ex post, joined up 
government in inverted commas, uh, if you like, but also the notion that there's a five year policy cycle and that the first half of that cycle and the second half are not the same. And we're just at that transitional moment between these two uh, periods. Now, there's going to be an opportunity, we've got about half an hour left uh, in this event, there's going to be an opportunity for anybody who's online to uh, ask a question or to make a comment about anything that they've heard so far. Uh, please feel free to do that. You can uh, ask it through the Q&A function, obviously, or also the chat function, or if you're not getting through, you can even send a message on EPRS WebEx. And I'd like to, obviously, that as many people as possible who'd like to intervene uh, should be able to do so in the next 30 minutes. Um, I'm going to hand the baton over in just a moment to uh, Dr. Joanna Apap, who is indeed one of those former doctoral students, I think, of, of uh, Helen Wallace's. Uh, she's now working for us as a policy analyst in EPRS. But before I do that, I'd just like to ask our two principal speakers, the co-authors and co-editors, if they've got any comments they would like to introduce at this stage on anything that the discussants have said. So, first of all, over to Helen to pick up on any issues that she would like to uh, share, any thoughts she'd like to share based on what happened in the three interventions uh, uh, since she introduced the event. Um, thank you, Anthony. Thank you to Jim and Gabby for very thoughtful and constructive comments, which have been, which add very heavily to our understanding of what might be going on. I mean, I wanted to mention a couple of points, really. I'm wondering whether Gabby is suggesting that somehow or other the European Union ought to be able to outperform the policy systems of member states in dealing with the tasks that lie in front of them. Uh, and I wonder whether that's realistic or not. Um, when I watch, but it's an extreme case, the difficulty of the current UK government in dealing with anything on its agenda, I think we have to be realistic about, you know, where things can go wrong and come unstuck. So we might all want to think a little bit about in this sense, the comparison between the European level and the country level. And the other thing I wanted to do is just make a comment on, well, two comments on Brexit. One, there was no map for the EU institutions as to how to deal with the Brexit process. And they came on to the enlargement accession process and reversed it to deal with secession, in my view, extremely capably. And I think that's quite interesting the way um, an existing methodology was applied to a new case. But the other thing that strikes me, Sean Monet was right, wasn't he? If you can tie the interdependencies of integration very thoroughly together, you make it bloody difficult, if you'll excuse me, to extricate yourself from the process. And apart from the fact that British governments have not been the most adept as you might have hoped in dealing with Brexit, some of it's to do with with the entanglement that European integration has produced. Thank you. Thank you. So effectively, engrenage doesn't really work in reverse, or uh, you can't unscramble eggs. Um, Alastair. I'd just like to add my, my thanks to Jim and Gabby for their comments. I was scribbling away furiously, so um, be prepared next time Oxford comes knocking for the ninth, ninth edition, um, and sort of picking up on on Helen's comments and the question about you know, Gabby's, you know, how much can we expect from the European Union? I mean, in the U.S., the focus is almost overwhelmingly on the EU's underperformance, um, and I try to point out to people that to an extent that's a feature, not a bug. The EU system, like the US system, is designed to be ineffective. You get only when I mean, you have separation of power, you have um, requirements of super majorities. So it's meant to be difficult for the center to impose its will, uh, to go against the will of the members. And so if you do not understand that and you keep judging the EU by the standards of, of a state, you're going to always be saying, well, why couldn't they just do this or that? Well, it's because they didn't have, you know, with this this flexibility has been occurring in the absence of existing institutions. So they've been having to make things up on the fly, which has meant you know they've had to create instruments. They've had to agree collectively. And when you start to understand that's what's going on, then the performance looks better. But if you do just compare it to uh, 
you know, what, a, what a state might do on its own. Um, and even, you know, as Helen points out, even the UK, which is traditionally recognized as a, a an effective state, <laughs> um, even it can get into trouble on uh, really, really thorny issues. Um, and the sort of the elephant in, in the room that both um, Jim and Gabby raised was what, you know, what does this, this moment of, you know, absolutely remarkable EU response to the horrific Russian invasion of Ukraine say about the future of European integration? Um, and I'm well outside my area of specialization here, but I have to say that I'm, I'm somewhat skeptical that this will lead to a, an ongoing transformation. I think the, the issue was that the, the Russian aggression was so egregious, um, that it fundamentally changed member states understanding of the Russian threat and therefore how to deal with it. Um, and this change has been most dramatic in Germany, but also you know, even Hungary, Italy, um, Sweden and Finland changing, you know, shifting from neutrality. I mean, these are really, really massive changes. But I wonder whether there are other situations where you'll have the same sort of sense of, um, of common sense of, of threat elsewhere, you know, things happening further away or not as explicit. I think the member states, again, will have trouble overcoming those differences. And I can see this acting as a spur for um, closer military cooperation under sort of reinvigorating you know, spur to things like PESCO and the European Defense Fund. Um, that, that would be a direct response to the Russian threat. But in terms of what it says about EU, European strategic autonomy in the wider world, um, I'm, I'm skeptical that it will travel. But as I say, I'm out of area on that one. So. Okay, thanks for that. And I think we're now in a position where we can move to Q&A. So I'm going to hand over to um, Joanna to take the conversation forward. Please don't be shy in coming forward with questions from the floor. You've got a fantastic opportunity with four really leading experts in different aspects of EU institutions, policy and politics. Uh, in the absence of any questions, I've got a couple I'm happy to pose myself later on, but I think it's, it's uh, over, over to Gabby now. Uh, yes. Sorry, to um, to Joanna, Joanna now. Okay. Yeah, please. Over <laughs> to Joanna so now. Much. Thank you so much, Anthony. And it's such an immense pleasure to host uh, in fact, uh, this event today, especially to see Helen Wallace, who was my PhD supervisor in action uh, live. So, yeah, really so happy to be here with you all. And um, truly for, and also I think it's great to have this debate between academics and also um, uh, practitioners, uh, policy, as also Gabby mentioned, indeed. These last eight editions, I really can't recommend them enough to you all who are, because it really shows us the span of the EU's transformation over time. And many things are still very applicable today to understand where we are, where we stand even today. So truly, as Helen mentioned at the beginning, it's good to have them actually, <laughs> all of them in your library. And, and this last edition highlighting the five modes of policy making, it's time in, in enabling us how, to understand how the union has acted both as a polity and also as a policy maker, especially now with the questions that come up, um, Alistair um, kind of touched upon this uh, a question that maybe we all have on our minds about how is it now, what is this acceleration that we're seeing in policy making maybe in the context of the Ukraine-Russia crisis? And so, now I have a number of questions already from from the floor. But before, in fact, I pass this. Um, I start reading out the questions from the floor. I have a, one quick question from my side. In this series, in the third series, in fact, of 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 these uh, of these editions, you had used the the metaphor of the uh, pendulum model, Helen, which was widely quoted, in fact, by many policymakers and policy analysts. And to what extent, so? When you look at the five so modes of policy making that you have highlighted also Alistair um, in your presentations, does it still does the pendulum metaphor still 
apply very much today also in policy making and then helping us analyze the transition so that we uh, that we kind of uh, are observing do you want me to answer the comment on that straight away joanna yes yes please um i mean i think it's quite useful but not determinedly useful but it's just a way of configuring the fact that things can swing in different di directions and different intensities at different times just to comment on the point about the Ukraine crisis and what will last. Part of what I think has made a big difference now is this popular engagement, the way people across Europe, across the space, are engaging with efforts to, in whatever ways are possible. And that's been putting huge pressure on what had been otherwise an elite and rather closed process of foreign policy work. How long that will persist is really hard to gauge. And we maybe need to look at the latter part of the 1940s and think about how, how the interaction between popular discussion and elite and political action, the, the, the incentives and the delays that belong to that period. Thank you. Thank you. So um, uh, now I think some, I have two questions from Michaela Del Monte, the colleague, in fact, head of unit of citizens policies unit in the EPRS. Um, the questions are especially addressed here to Alistair. So Professor Young, um, Michaela writes, men, uh, mentioned that uh, overall the EU showed over time a great flexibility and resilience toward external and internal shocks, such as Brexit, and the current crisis in Ukraine. What happened then in 2015 during the so-called migrate, migratory crisis? So, this view, what, so what prevented member states to show the necessary, the necessary resilience in this case? Or do they show maybe enough flexibility? It's an open question So from Michaela. Alistair? Yeah, well, again, I'm, I'm speaking for, for others as that was, and, and the point, and this goes to the point I was, I was making about the, the EU to an extent being designed for, you know, weakness and migration crisis was, went right to that, the way that the system was set up, there was no incentive for the, you know, for member states to share the burden if they did not feel solidarity and this is one of the places where as we mentioned the, the sort of the populist pressure was most strong on a number of governments one of the things that is interesting in the current situation is that the countries that were least willing to show solidarity in 2015 are now the ones confronting the primary burden of the refugees fleeing the conflict in ukraine and so this may, you know, there may be, uh, you know, this may change the view that collective action as a way of distributing burdens is valuable. Whereas before it was all, uh, it was all about trying to, you know, placate um, domestic populations and to keep, um, you know, control at the state level and not be forced to do things they didn't want to do. Thank you. Um, a second question from uh, Michaela, which I would address then to all of you, though. Um, uh, so whoever wants to step in, you can take it in turns. So it's about differentiated integration. To what extent could this be a way forward in EU politics, to your view? I don't know if maybe Jim, you would like uh, to start actually with this, perhaps. Please, Jim. Yes, uh, on differentiated integration, this is an instrument which we've used in the past to great effect. Uh, I think in the present circumstances, uh, most of the elements uh, we are needing is actually more integration, uh, not less integration. So uh, I think this is an instrument we use when we have to. Uh, it's always been used uh, with the idea not to be stalled and to move forward than others join. It has been highly successful. I do not think in the present circumstances it's a great idea. If the idea is vis-a-vis uh, -vis Ukraine and others to come back with the old idea of the Conference of Europe where you would 
you know, some member states are real member states and you have others who are second category. I don't believe in it uh, for a second. Uh, very quickly, uh, on Alistair's uh, point, I disagree with him on, on the point of uh, the effect of today. And not because I'm short sighted, but simply uh, because the movement you've seen over the last few days is extraordinary under the pressure of the populations. That will not go away. And it will not go away. Why? Because actually, I mean, I've been sitting in every single European Council meetings between 2006 and 2020. From 2010 and 12 onwards, there has been a marked change of tone within the European Council, and particularly since 2016, Brexit and uh, Trump. And so I think now where people see that the union has to be a global actor if it wants to survive and defend it, its values, it has to defend its interests, I think this will be a catalyzer a catalyst of something which was in the process of happening any, anyway. A very quick remark on uh, migration. Uh, on migration, even on migration, we are doing many things why, which we never did before. We've actually done a bit of real politics with the Turks, it worked. The one thing which clouds the whole thing is the misguided attempt at the time by the Commission to impose quotas, obligatory quotas. That has pushed us it has made us lose six years because that's the reason why we can't agree. But I guarantee you, the union will, in the next two, three, or four years, agree on the reform of the asylum and migration system. The Ukraine crisis will further contribute that because we have to. So even on migration, actually, the trend is, in my view, towards doing far more things together. Thank you. Um, in fact, uh, Jim, a question then on that, uh, because in the latest council, so debate on the Sunday when they were discussing about, so how to deal with inflows, in fact, of people needing uh, asylum from Ukraine, weren't they discussing on finally using the 2001 directive on temporary protection? Wasn't this uh, a bit the idea? I think you're muted. No, that, yeah, that's a different issue. Uh, I am talking about obligatory quotas of redistribution of people coming in illegally. The question of temporary uh, protection is one where everybody actually basically agrees now, and this will allow to deal with the Ukrainian thing. Actually, many of the member states have already nationally taken the measures, uh, for instance, to let the uh, Ukrainians come in. They don't have to do uh, the procedure, for instance, for asylum or anything like that. They will have three years to stay here. Uh, and I think this will change further. The debate about migration, because as uh, you said before, I mean the uh, the most difficult countries were countries like Poland, Hungary, etc. In the uh, migration issue, now this will further open up things. And I think the only important thing is uh, the, uh, the 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 obligatory migration proposal quota migration was the wrong solution at the wrong time. It was not the solution because it was a drop in the ocean compared to the inflows of 1.8 million of people coming illegally uh, in 2015. And it secondly gave the impression that anybody could come in and then we just sort things out by sending them around, you know, via Schaffendas and this kind of thing. Uh, I think people have understood now. So solidarity, absolutely necessary. But I tell you, at this level, it only works if it's voluntary. But I think it will happen, as you've seen now uh, on the Ukraine crisis. Thank you. Jo Joanna, can yes. I ask you a question about that? Yes because I w wonder rather sceptically whether the progress that's been made on migration and that you envisage is possible because you don't have the UK in the room any longer. You're muted, uh, Jim. So, I'm mute. It is a good question. It's very difficult to say. Uh, in, in many areas, I mean, let's be honest, some member countries like my own, uh, Luxembourg, on trade matter, on, on taxation and things, were hiding behind the Brits. So I think simply blaming the Brits for everything which didn't work before is probably not the right approach. But yes, on this, definitely on the RRF, on the, on the, uh, the fund uh, and the very revolutionary idea of taking up future debt together, the Brits would never have worked with this. They would have tried to sabotage it. And in the end, they would have at least asked for a knockout in it. There's no question. So there, I think uh, uh, Brexit has actually helped us 
Migration, I don't know. Historically speaking, of course, the um, British were always telling us that we were a fortress and we should be much more open. Don't forget that it was Britain which didn't want to have transition rules uh, for the new country, which is not migration, but free movement. But uh, uh, so uh, they've now completely changed this. But uh, yeah, I don't know. Thank you so much. I have another question from oh, Anna. Can you want to, kind of you want in to first, yes, please. please yeah. so. Thank you very much. Sorry for interrupting. Um, on on the two points. So Helen, one point you you ask whether this means that the EU should outperform member states. Absolutely not. So the EU is is actually currently still front runner in opening up the time horizon for policy time horizon for policy making and for advocating for more anticipatory policy modes that we need horizon scanning um, exactly to identify the issues the black swans in a moment when we still can react so the network of uh, foresight experts for example inaugurated by the commission the vice president on on, on foresight actually encourages and asks member states to build up these anticipatory policy making capacities with the ministers for the future, but also with um, administrative units, uh, central government level for anticipatory policy making. So I do think at, at that level, it's rather going hand in hand for modernization of policy making and for opening up the time horizon uh, and potentially detach it to a certain extent from the electoral cycle. Um, inspired not only but strongly by climate change policies where we actually have the 2050 and in some areas when we look into threat perception already the 20, 2100 perspective. So it's rather going hand in hand to modernize and not to outperform. And the other point is to differentiate it integration. I do think that and here also climate change and environmental policies offer, offer a certain flexibilization. Um, at instrumental level, I do think that the current transformative and economic pressure is too big on all members um, to make differentiated integration in terms of membership or in terms of integration death in single policy areas a, a feasible option. We have flexibilization at instrumental level if we look into the board burden sharing mechanism or the um, the stronger integration of cohesion elements in the Just Transition Fund, for example, into EU policy making on a daily basis. So I also think that differentiated integration, as we have studied it in the past with different groups and different circles aligning around the EU key is not a particularly attractive or feasible situation or, or proposal at the moment. Thank you. Thank you so much. I have now a question from Beatrice Visconti, who asks us, what are the challenges encountered in writing this edition? So address the fact of both of you as co-editors, Helen and Alistair. Helen, maybe you want to go first? Uh, you're muted. I mean, the, the different sorts of challenges, aren't there? One is figuring out what the choice of case studies is going to be for the next edition because it's already a very long book with 70 pages in the bibliography and you can't do everything and then you've got to find appropriate authors to deal with particular chapters and that there's a whole design and mobilization set of issues there after that it's bloody hard work and alice just bore more of the hard work than i did in the last edition and i've done more in previous editions um, it's a big book to get to, to put to bed. Alistair? I mean, beyond the sort of the, the logistical chat, I mean, and, you know, us, Oxford is very, you know, I think we're probably beyond what we were supposed to have in terms of our page extent. And so um, there's always an issue because, you know, the, there's always the, you know, we get reviews and, um, you know, there's who people want more. Gabby's asking for more. It's a, the reviewers always want more. Um, the uh, Oxford wants new material, but you can't jettison some stuff. You can't jettison, and you want so so trying to manage the volume of information is is challenging. This edition was particularly challenging um, because. We wanted to address Brexit, but Brexit kept dragging on. Yes. 
um, we actually had to ask for an extension so we could even get past um, the UK formally leaving before we could. Uh, and then we also had the challenge of of addressing um, the you know the pandemic you know, hit just shortly before we were supposed to go to press, but you couldn't like pretend it didn't happen. So there, and there was the challenge of and I personally was driven mad by you know doing drafts of the single market chapter and the trade chapter with my tenses on Brexit and what would you know and wasted a lot of time on cliff edge Brexits and what were the options because every it changed every time that um, so that was so sort of dealing with moving events and so the book doesn't date the second it's published um, was a particular challenge um, in this edition, but it's you know it's the challenge of coordinating a bunch of different um, authors and getting them to sort of address a common set of questions. There, I mean, it's, as it's a textbook, there isn't an overarching framework, but we do want to try and get them to engage with the terminology of the policy modes, and we ask them explicitly to think about what were the implications of these challenges that we had identified. Um, some did it better than others. It's just whatever happens when you have an edited volume. Thank you so much. I have a question from Nicola Cianzini, and then uh, maybe uh, um, Anthony, you would like also to put one of your questions, perhaps, before we come to close off the event. Thank you very much for that opportunity. I have to leave actually very soon after um, 3 p.m., so, so maybe... I won't be able to ask a question, but I'll say uh, a, a thank you at the end to everybody. Okay. Okay, so then I put the question of Nicola Cianzini, who, uh, because I, uh, I mean, I, I know that your book, in fact, went to the editors in, uh, it was around summer 2020, wasn't it? And what is your opinion, therefore, um, now about the evolution of the work of the conference on the future of Europe? And how, how do you consider so the work done so far? Maybe you could all take a little round, in fact, because I know, I'm sure you're all following it very closely. Hello? Me. So just say for me, I've not been following it closely. I was a bit of skeptic about the idea. Um, I get nervous about expectations being raised and outputs being limited. But that's perhaps just me being skeptical. <laughs> I see Jim apparently agreeing also. Jim, you want to come yeah, in directly? Or Alistair? Well, I, I but also have not been following it closely and I'm also. Um, it's one of these things that I'll wait for the outcome and then I'll worry about it because I'm also skeptical about expectations and how well they are going to be realized. What makes you especially skeptical though? So Jim, perhaps you want to? No, just very, I don't want, I mean, it's difficult in two words to talk about this. Uh, I have been quite skeptical about it. There's one good thing about it and that is this idea of participation of uh, people drawn by lots. Uh, there are some interesting uh, things there, they're very motivated. So that's the process in itself is good. But I agree that, uh, you know, some people were pushing this to have a major treaty changes. I don't believe in them. I don't think we need them right now. And so you always have the risk, and I agree here both with uh, Alistair and uh, Helen, that you, you overpromise and then uh, you don't do it. Uh, and you don't follow these great ideas that we've become, I have a president and the United States and all this rubbish. And then you don't do it, and then people say, oh, Europe doesn't function. I think Europe is a daily miracle, actually, the way it functions. Yeah, maybe if I can add to that. So I, I agree that the process of it actually um, satisfied demand that is there not only in, in, in citizens, but also in the political system to get ahead and, and, and move forward on the participatory governance element, but rather on, on the downside of it, I also agree with, with Helen and Alistair that the problem is that the system doesn't seem to be clear about how to absorb the ideas into the reform cycle. So potentially rather better than having these huge exercises by and, and creating expectations that can't be fulfilled, we really should go further into reflecting on couple design. So on 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 attaching citizen assemblies in whatever way to existing institutional features and really stabilize that into the policy making process at a pre-agenda setting or agenda setting moment rather than having these huge conferences 
with then the expectations not being met in terms of influence on policy making. Well, as we're now in fact coming up to time, um, I would like to thank you very much, all of you, in fact, for your excellent views and much frankness actually that you shared with us. And I pass maybe for last words to Anthony. For the floor to you, Anthony. Thank you very much indeed, Joanna, for curating that uh, conversation. And uh, thank you very much, of course, to our four speakers, the two authors and co-editors -author, uh, co and, and co-authors of the book itself, the eighth edition. And it's been really a great pleasure to have you on board for this EPRS book talk and our two discussants who've given pithy insights about uh, not only the strengths and weaknesses, if I may say so, of the book, uh, though I think it's getting stronger and stronger with the passage of time. And I think the action checklist, which um, Gabby shared for uh, further enhancements, perhaps in five years rather than three years, if OUP is anything <laughs> based on OUP's reputation, if that's the likely timescale, um, uh, uh, is very, very helpful in terms of a way forward. Um, so to uh, both Jim um, and to Gabi, thank you very much for joining uh, Helen and Alistair in this discussion, which I think has been very stimulating and I hope hopefully much enjoyed by the people who've been online watching it. And for those of you who are interested, as many of our um, viewers are, in uh, EU institutional issues, I should just tell you that um, in a couple of weeks' time, on Thursday the 17th of March, We'll be having a further EPRS policy roundtable in this sort of broad area of, of uh, institutions under the title In the Shadow of Jacques Delors, the Politics of European Commission Presidents Since the 1980s, in which we'll be looking at those uh, success factors, if you like, uh, in determining uh, how successive Commission Presidents have performed and how they are now seen with the passage of time. So looking forward to that very much indeed. And just to say a big thank you to all of our speakers and a big thank you also to the audience. It's been great to have you on board and look forward to seeing you at another EPRS event soon. Thank you so much and have a very nice afternoon. Bye bye, everybody. Thank you very much. Thank bye. You. bye. 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 bye.